As we continue through Revelation, we're in chapter 4, and we've been con uh, continuing to look at what is in the throne room of God. Because as the church faces difficulties, persecution, it's easy to forget scripture. It's a lot simpler to remember pictures. And so God shows his throne room in these pictures that when we're struggling and under the pressure of rejection and threats of bad things happening, we can remember these pictures. So we are seeking to explain the pictures with lots of words so that we will remember the pictures and be able to get, in a sense, a, a concise understanding of them for those times where we don't have an opportunity to listen to a sermon or go through a commentary or read sections of scripture. So we're going to read again uh, Revelation 4 and then focus on verse 6. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God, and before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, and who is, and who is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne, and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So today we're focusing on verse 6. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. Whatever we picture right now is going to determine how much help we get from the picture when we're going through difficult times. So we're going to try and give a in-depth enough picture or explanation that we just have to remember the picture and in a sense it will come flooding into our hearts, the comfort and the encouragement that is there. The verse begins, and before the throne. What we're seeing is this contrast between what do I see down here before me and what do I see up there before the throne? Whichever one I think is more solid and real and lasting will determine how I feel about my life and my experience. So, John is, in a sense, calling us, fix your eyes before the throne because there's something there that is of huge significance to how you live here. So the question that I was thinking as I was considering this is, what is before the throne of God that stifles our fear of enemies and silences our interest in worldly pleasures. Because if you think Jesus has started a church, he said that the church he builds will prevail against the gates of hell. So the church he builds, which is going to last for all time, or yeah, for all time, we are going to be confronted with things intended to stop us from being that church. And there's two primary things that the evil one will do to get you to stop being the, the member of the body of Christ that Jesus designed you to be. One of those things is 
to put so many enemies around you that it terrifies you and so you just go quiet. The other is to present worldly pleasures in such abundance that you see those pleasures as if they are better than your life in Christ. So if he can use enemies to scare you or pleasures to entice you, he can get you away from your first love, your on-fire devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. So John is saying, but look at what's before the throne. And I believe that what's before the throne, it gives us everything we need so we don't have to be afraid of our enemies and we would never be enticed by worldly passions and interests no matter how many are there because we see what's before the throne. Hopefully that is the effect it will have on us. So, before the throne is the Holy Spirit, those seven torches of fire. That is telling us the Holy Spirit is complete in every way. He's everything that the complete church will need for the fullness of time. Now we see that there's a sea of glass like crystal, and it is promising complete cleansing to all who come to Christ. Those two things before the throne should draw all our attention away from our enemies who scare us, from the pleasures that entice us, to what God is giving us instead. So, uh, the verse says, There was, as it were, a sea. If you are now picturing a favorite time that you were down at the ocean, down at the seashore, and you're picturing this sea spread out before the throne of God, wrong picture. It might have some meaning there, but that's not the picture. What I want to show is, and, and this is a, a theme that I think we've settled into, is the pictures before the throne of God are taking us through what scriptures already told us so that instead of having to remember all those scriptures, we just remember the picture. So what has scripture already said about a sea that would indicate to us what this is supposed to bring to mind. So, in 1 Kings 7, when Solomon is preparing, uh, you know, the temple's been built, and he's preparing what goes inside the temple, in 1 Kings 7, verse 23, it says, Then he made the sea of cast metal. It was round, ten cubits from brim to brim, and five cubits high, and a line of 30 cubits measured its circumference. Under its brim were gourds for 10 cubits, compassing the sea all around. The gourds were in two rows, cast with it when it was cast. It stood on 12 oxen, three facing north, three facing west, three facing south, and three facing east. The sea was set on them, and all their rear parts were inward. Its thickness was a handbreadth, and its brim was made like the brim of a cup, like the flower of a lily. It held 2,000 baths. That's the sea. In other words, the sea that's before the throne of God in heaven is taking us back to the temple where the sea was, was made out of molten bronze, and it was put into the holy place for a certain purpose. So now that we see this crystal sea that's before the throne, we're seeing, in a sense, what the earthly copied. This is what it looks like in reality. It's a sea before the throne of God. So, this bronze sea in the temple was 17 and a half feet in diameter. Now, this room is about 19 and a half feet long and about 14 feet wide. So, if you turned this room into a bowl, it probably would fit inside that sea. In other words, at least as big as this room. It was eight and, eight and three quarter feet deep. So, this room is eight feet deep. Add three quarters of a foot, and that's how deep this was. The wall was a hand breadth, so about three and a half inches thick. And it held between 16,000 and 20,000 gallons of water. That's the background that now we see this crystal sea before the throne of God. We're to make this connection. This immense sea. And of course I do believe it pictures 
something beyond the, the symbol itself. Now, 2 Chronicles 4 adds to the picture of 1 Kings 7, verse 6. He also made ten basins in which to wash, and set five on the south side and five on the north side. In these they were to rinse off what was used for the burnt offering, and the sea was for the priests to wash in. So, along with this sea that was this huge, there were ten basins made, five on the north, five on the south. The, the priests would take whatever animal was brought as a burnt offering after it had been prepared and it would be washed in these basins. The priests would be washed in the sea. And so the life of the temple, you could almost see the priests coming in at the start of their shift, their service in the temple, and they would come for their cleansing, and then they would bring the sacrifices, which were all to be cleansed in these other basins. So we're starting from this, this picture that the sea was for the priests to wash in. That is the clue about this whole picture. As we then picture that before the throne of God is this sea that looks glassy, like crystal. Glass at their time wasn't as clear as it is for us now. So it's clarified. It looks glassy, but the way crystal is glassy. The necessity of the sea is that the priest needed somewhere to wash. It's also declaring the provision. In other words, the whole idea of the temple, of the holy place of God, is that's where people meet God. So on one side, that sea before the throne says, you need to be cleansed. But on the other side, it says, your cleansing is provided for. Part of the picture as we've been building is that around the throne are 24 elders. So, what did we learn about the 24 elders? Well, our best understanding of them is that they are the priests representing the people of God. So, if the sea is for the priests to wash in, what does that have to do with you? What would give you encouragement when you're having a really bad day because you sinned? Well, what would encourage you looking before the throne and seeing a sea if it's for the priests to wash in? And that's where we have to put all these scriptures together. So, Exodus 9 verse 6 says, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So God saw his whole kingdom as priests. 1 Peter 2 verse 9 confirms that for the church. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So a royal priesthood is a priesthood of kings. So we are a priesthood of kings. Uh, Revelation 1 verse 5. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests, to his God and Father. So up to this point, even to the first chapter of Revelation, the message of God's word is, you who are believers in Jesus Christ are a kingdom of priests, the 24 elders we see in chapter 4 represent you, not as priests over you who aren't priests, but as priests representing the priesthood of all believers. And then Revelation 5 verse 9 says, And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. All these scriptures are here to basically say, do you associate yourself with the presence of God, with the 24 elders around the throne who are representing the priesthood of all believers, and that the sea before the throne is for the priests to wash in? In other words, it's for every believer to come before God as a priest who is washed in this sea. That is the, the essence of the picture. So when you are going through a difficult time, you don't feel the least bit like a priest 
because of how you're struggling with things in your life, the C is there to remind you, but the provision for your cleansing is there. The priests had to wash. There wasn't one priest throughout the whole history of the Old Testament who didn't have to wash because he had to be cleansed of his own sins on a daily basis. So this is the encouragement we get as we come to this picture. Now, Isaiah 43 verse 25 says, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. So while this C has a very particular application to that historical image of the sea put in the temple. It also is a reminder of every single scripture where God talks about taking away your sins. So Isaiah in, in a time when he was warning Israel about their sins and that their sins would lead them into captivity, the way God wanted them to think about him was as the one who blots out their transgressions that he will not remember their sins. Now people sometimes struggle with how can the infinite eternal God ever forget sin. And that's not the point. The point is, when someone remembers sins, it's meaning and they bring it to remembrance. You know what it's like when you're having a, a discussion with someone and they bring up things that you've done in the past that are making them suspicious of you right now? Like, remember when you did this? I can't trust you because remember when you did this? When God says, I will not remember your sins, it doesn't mean he has forgotten about them. It means, I will never bring your sins up and say, I have to treat you a certain way because remember when you did this. He looks at us across that glassy sea where he has washed away our sins. He's taken the water of that sea and he's blotted our sins out of his book. So when the judgment comes and he opens to our page, it's all been blotted out. It's a blank page. He will not remember them to you or to anyone else. Micah 7 from verse 18. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. So there's a scripture that when we come to this sea that is before the throne of God, we can say, that is God's reminder to you when you're coming before his throne and you might feel a little bit intimidated by that lightning and the rumblings and the peals of thunder that you are to remember, no, but there's that sea. And that sea is where he's thrown all my sins. He's thrown my sins into the depths of the sea. And so it is a constant reminder that God is not going to remember those things and hold them against us. We are pure and clean in his eyes because of that sea. When the apostle, who we know as the apostle Paul, was converted, he was a man named Saul, a Jewish man who was very angry against the church, doing a lot to persecute Christians. He was called by God to not only be a Christian, but to become the apostle Paul who would preach Christ. God sent a man named Ananias to Saul to explain to him what was going on and Ananias said to Saul in Acts 22.16, And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. We do not believe in what's called baptismal regeneration, that if you get baptized, you're saved. But there is such a clear connection between us coming to repentance and faith and declaring that through baptism, that we are able to say, or, or Ananias was able to say to Saul, come through the waters of baptism so your sins can be washed away as you call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So part of this sea before the throne of God, it reminds us that our baptism, that picture of us being immersed into the water where we died with Christ, where we were buried with him in baptism, and then were raised out of the waters, symbolizing how we were made alive in Christ, 
the crystal sea is a declaration to you. Remember when you were baptized? Remember when you confessed Christ in that way? Remember when you repented of your sins? Baptism says your sins have been washed away. And so the water that is a recurring theme throughout the scriptures, uh, Noah's Ark saved through the water, Israel delivered through the parting of the waters, and now uh, the waters of baptism being rem brought to our remembrance in the, re in the sea before the throne of God, it's all to tell us, people, your sins have been washed away. When you picture yourself standing in the throne room of God, it's not as some wretched, despised sinner under the watchful eye of God's condemnation. It's as people who've come and had their sins washed away. 1 Corinthians 6 from verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So, basically we can say, remove that sea from between you and the throne, you could never come into the kingdom of God. So Paul continues, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. What that means is the sea of glass like crystal is there before the throne so that whenever you look at God, you can't escape that part of the picture that your sins have been washed away. You come there and you feel that there's something wrong with you because of your past sins. And that sea of glass like crystal says, but all your past sins are in there. They're not on you. God doesn't see you through your sin. He sees you through the crystal sea where there is no sin. Nothing that he remembers. And so we are to stand before the throne. Even now we're to come with boldness before the throne of grace. Not to receive condemnation for all those sins but to receive grace and mercy because our sins have been washed away. Ephesians 5, in the example of how husbands are to love their wives, from verse 25, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Now, what is it we should think of ourselves when we see ourselves before the throne of this holy God with lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder coming from his throne? What are we supposed to think of ourselves? We're to think of ourselves as the bride of Christ that will be presented before him in splendor. No spot, nor ri no wrinkle, that we might be holy and without blemish. Now, who has done that? You see, if you're thinking under the law, you don't see that crystal sea. You see you and God on a holy throne. You have to figure out how to be good enough for him to accept you, which is impossible. But when you see the crystal sea between you and God, it's a reminder that Jesus Christ gave himself up for his church to sanctify her, the church, the bride of Christ, to wash her. So, what is your hope of ever being good enough for God? It is the finished work of Jesus Christ where now you've been washed in that sea. Now you have the perfect hope that he sees you as pure, as holy, as undefiled. And no longer are we ever going to be judged by our past in sin. Titus 3 from verse 3. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, 
not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The sea reminds you that you come to God through the washing of regeneration that you have been born again through the washing of the blood of Jesus Christ, setting you free from sin. Now you are justified by his grace. Right now you are. That's why we're told to come before the throne of grace. Now, in prayer. Right now we're justified. We are going to become the heirs according to the hope of eternal life. In other words, we are heirs who have not yet received our inheritance. What are we supposed to think about when we go before our father? That we're like that black sheep who gets kicked out, or we're like that prodigal son who doesn't belong at home? Or do we think, no, we already are heirs. Our inheritance is waiting for us on the other side of that crystal sea. The crystal sea says it's yours because your sins have been taken away. Hebrews 9 from verse 13. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? In other words, if that sea that was in the original temple and all the sacrifices that were washed in those ten... Uh, bowls, if all of that gave the outer cleansing that made it possible for people to keep coming to God, how much more, now that it's the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed, do you have every assurance that you are washed clean? That you are your conscience is purified from the dead works you used to do, that now you can serve the living God. What did the priests do? They served God in his temple. How did John start his, his letter, Revelation 1.1? 1, 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. See, at the very beginning of the book, first verse, we were introduced to a thought that now that it's become very clear that we're not servants, as in uh, doing menial tasks in a household, we're the priests who serve in the temple. In others, we are the servants who are a kingdom of priests who serve in the holy place constantly, enjoying the pleasures of God, uh, the pleasures that are his, at his right hand forevermore. And so we are the servants who need that assurance that our sins are washed away. We have that place that our washing is completely provided for. Revelation 22 from verse 14 Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Now, why do you have the right to go through the gates of that new Jerusalem to the tree of life? Well, in chapter 4, it says... Because that throne room of God, you have access to the throne of God through the crystal sea. On the other side of God are the gates to the new Jerusalem where the tree of life is. It's like we're to see all those things just lining up in their place behind God. And there's that crystal sea before the throne saying, you are washed clean. You're not those who are outside. You are those who are going to come in to that city because you've already come into Christ. 1 Peter 3, verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, talking about Noah saved through the flood, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So, 
we can look back at the event when Noah's ark saved him and his family and, and, the, and many animals from the flood. We can then look at our baptism and say, what we confess by faith in Jesus Christ, baptism shows not that we came out of the tank clean, physically, but that our conscience is now clean because all our sins are washed away. And so now we have this hope that when we see Jesus at the right hand of God and we see angels and authorities and powers all subjected to him, who, where do we fit in? We fit in with him as a kingdom of priests, not as enemies and powers and authorities that are under his feet. We are actually going to be with him, reigning with him, because of who we are through his blood. Now, one of the things that really spoke to me this morning was the reminder that in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, three things came into the world. Guilt, shame, and fear. Guilt came, we, it says their eyes were opened and they were suddenly aware of their uh, nakedness. In other words, when, when Eve ate the fruit, their eyes weren't open. Adam still felt okay that he could do it. As soon as he ate, both their eyes were opened and now there was no escaping. They had just blown it. They were absolutely wrong. They were guilty. Shame came because they suddenly had to hide their nakedness. First they started <laughs> grabbing fig leaves and sewing them together to try and make covering. But then when they heard God, they knew that wasn't enough. So they went and hid behind trees as well. That was shame. They were aware of the shamefulness of their condition and then fear uh, they said I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself far too many Christians are still living with guilt shame and fear that came in in the Garden of Eden shame guilt and fear contrast with the righteousness joy and peace of God's kingdom Romans 4.17 says, For the, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So on one side, the, the sin has brought guilt, shame, and fear into our lives. On the other side, the kingdom of God brings righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. How is that possible? Because our sins have been washed away. It's not because we finally attained enough good works that they outweigh our bad works it's that we now have a righteousness that is by faith we have peace and joy in the Holy Spirit we don't deserve it but we are to see that it is ours and that brought or that crystal sea is to remind us of what is there another thing that really encouraged me there's a song I love it's called Calvary is the sea and it's the imagery of our love for God is like this little drop of dew, but Calvary is the sea. Meaning, when you consider the immensity of the seas that cover our planet, that is the love of God in contrast to your tiny little bit of love for Him. But when I, I actually saw this title, I realized Calvary is the sea. Calvary is the, the crystal sea before God. Calvary is where Jesus laid down his life so that your sins could be taken away. Calvary is the washing that takes away your sin so that you can stand in the presence of this holy God without any fear whatsoever. And so we are reminded not just of a crystal sea, but it represents Calvary. It represents all of redemption. It represents the whole picture of the temple and God preparing us to see the law can never make you right with God. You need the blood of Jesus Christ to do that. And now it's just this beautiful crystal clear <laughs> sea before the presence of God saying, the sea is still clean. It has washed away your sins. They're gone. You are cleansed and forgiven. One of the things that this has to speak to is the struggles of persecuted Christians. When we are persecuted, it tends to communicate we've done something wrong, 
we are concerned about our families. How will we take care of them? There are plenty of stories of Christians who have lost their homes, they've lost their jobs, they've been kicked out of their families. What is the message that we are to hold on to when we look before the throne of God? So Luke 21 from verse 16 says, You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance you will gain your lives. Now by endurance it doesn't mean enduring in good works, that we somehow attain this, by enduring in the gospel. When we go through anything, if we will endure in the gospel, if we will endure with a sense of that crystal sea promises me that I'm cleansed and forgiven and I have access to the throne room of God forever, so when I die, whether it be through persecution or natural causes, I am going to be able to enter the holy place of God because my sins have been taken away. I could be hurting. Uh, we're told that Jesus will wipe away our tears. Some of those tears will be Christians arriving in heaven because they've just been put to death by their own family members. Grieving that their family members were doing this, they die and immediately they're with Christ who wipes away those tears. In other words, don't let what's happened here, the hurts, the heartaches, ever dissuade us from what God has given us through the gospel. The sea that is before the throne is glass like crystal, meaning it's crystal clear. I found it interesting that it, it uh, associated the word perspicuity with what this is representing. And that word means simply stated and easy to understand. And it's almost like you just all you've got there is this sea of glass like crystal. It's simply stated and easy to understand what that means. Do you need any assurance that your sins are taken away? Just look at the sea. Remember everything. You can't remember the scripture about your sins being thrown into the sea and God not remembering your sins any longer and all those things. But just look at how simply he says it. Before the throne was a sea of glass like crystal. Your sins are washed away. That means that everything that's left for us in the book of Revelation is ours to take hold of because the, the throne room of God in Revelation 4 isn't to scare God's children away. It's to show us how absolutely assured we are that everything God has promised and all the victories that will come are ours forever and we can take hold of them with all our heart. The conclusion is that we should have both conviction and confidence. The conviction should be, I need cleansing. I can't possibly think God would want me in his presence without cleansing. It's ridiculous. On the other side, there's the confidence. It should be, but he's provided the cleansing. So come with confidence through the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. We won't feel the confidence that we are clean while we have no conviction that we are unclean. And so in simplicity, the crystal sea says, you absolutely need to be cleansed, and you absolutely are cleansed if you come through that sea. I believe that at this point in our journey, every Christian should be saying, I have no hope in myself. I have absolute hope in the God who sits on the throne. And so, as you struggle with sin, as you struggle with a sense of well-being in Christ. Keep these pictures that, that God has that before his throne. And in a sense, from here on in, every time you picture him on the throne, see that sea of glass clearly telling you you have the forgiveness of sins and the way that should affect you right now is come boldly into his presence. Present all your requests to God. Cast all your cares before him because he cares for you. And whenever you doubt it, just remember the crystal sea. Amen.